and the police investigating his murder believed that the culprit was most likely an ex-police officer vigilante, as the bullet recovered from Deleste's body was actually the same type that the police used. They said that there was most likely an entire group of these vigilantes targeting rappers in order to silence them. One what? of Deleste's friends, where a man is burning head to toe in flames, oh, while the police snap. and fans use their jackets to smother the flames. What's good? Dark Knight Gang in the stank, gang, gang. Today I'm about to do a, a dark, sinister type video. It's from the YouTube channel Savox. Sa Savox. Something like that. Anyway, this one right here is titled Eight More Horrifying Incidents That Happened Live. Y'all requested it. Don't trip you not. Got y'all. It's nighttime. Y'all know I like to get dark in the night, bro. It happens. Bro, we're going to watch this. This is a 30 minute video. No, I'm not cutting it into two parts. We're going to watch the whole thing together. We're going to enjoy ourselves. You feel me? I'm ready to hop into this video. Yeah, let's go. In 1985, Bradford City Football Club was celebrating one of its most successful seasons, having gone undefeated for 13 games and winning the Division 3 trophy, guaranteeing their promotion to Division 2 for the first time since 1937. Okay. The final game of the season would take place on their home court and would be against Lincoln City. Bradford Stadium itself was a very old venue that had had little alterations made to it since 1911. The main stand a wooden structure designed to hold 5,300 spectators had been cited as unsafe huh? due to a large buildup of litter in the gaps between the seats. The city oh, council had That's told the club's management that a carelessly discarded cigarette could give rise to a fire risk. Despite this, the club management more or less ignored these warnings, with the only alteration made to the stand being a new steel roof. The seating area remained unchanged, and as a result, the litter continued to build up. On May 11th, why nobody cleaned it up though? They didn't have a janitor? All right, let's 11th, keep going. 1985, Bradford played their final match against Lincoln before being promoted. The match has been described as having been very boring, with neither side even coming close to scoring in the first 40 minutes. At 3.44 p.m., just before halftime, commentator John Helm informed the television audience that a fire had started in the main stand. And we've actually got a fire in the stand on the far side of the ground. And th I wonder if people got out and That looks very nasty indeed. The police, who were present at the game, immediately began ushering people out of the stand. This brought the game to a halt, as fans had to make their way onto the pitch to get to safety. In less than a minute, the fire had engulfed an entire row of seats, with Less the steel roof minute? trapping most of the smoke inside the stand. Within seconds, another row of seats caught fire. The fans in the main stand began panicking and were frantically rushing to get out, with some falling oh, over the ledge to escape. Of course. By this point, about half of the stand was engulfed in flames, and many of the fans had still not been able to escape. Less than oh. a minute later, the entire stand was in flames, and the police and fans were struggling to make it to safety, as flaming debris was blowing onto the pitch. In the space of barely over five minutes, the entire stand had gone up in flames. Just in five minutes? I wonder how many people died. They, bro, that's, I don't want to get burned to death. That's insane. I know With that the whole hurt. event being broadcasted live on TV. In total, 56 people died and 56. over 260 people were injured. The fire Dang. had apparently started when a man who'd come over from Australia to visit his son dropped a lit cigarette onto the floorboard and attempted to put it out with his foot. However, the cigarette slipped through a hole in the floorboard. A minute later, the man saw a small plume of smoke, so he poured his coffee onto it to put it out. At first, it seemed that this had worked, yeah. but a minute or so later, there was suddenly a bigger whoosh of smoke. So they went to get a steward. By the time they got back, the whole stand was in flames. There were no fire extinguishers on site. So the man that started it, he left. He came back and the whole thing was in flames. He started it and, and he was all in of safety. the exits had been locked. In the aftermath oh. of the fire, a memorial service was held, which 6,000 people attended. 28 police officers and 22 fans received commendations for their efforts in saving people from the fire. Bradford City ended up having to pay a total of 20 million pounds to the injured or bereaved police officers and fans. Mm. I'd actually seen this footage in school during a fire safety event when I was 14. The one shot from this incident that's always stayed with me 
is one that I can't actually show you, where a man is burning head to toe in flames, oh, while the police snap. and fans use their jackets to smother the flames in a desperate attempt to save the man's life. He However, he rolling? sadly later died from his injuries. Uh, in the years since the incident, stop, drop, and roll, the stadium bro. has been completely revamped with the wooded main stand being replaced by a huge steel and concrete structure. The club obviously wanted to make sure that there was no chance of another harrowing event like this ever taking place again. Bro, what would you do in that situation? If you were a bystander, you just sitting there, you watching the game, a fire starts. He said in five minutes, the whole stand was on fire, bro. Do you know how quickly you have to get out of your seat, push past everybody, jump onto the field? 26 people died. I think he said like 56 people were injured. Man, that's scary right there. Just to put yourself in that situation. You just sitting back, you watching a soccer game, having the time of your life, you feel me? And then boom, fire strikes and it's going fast. Ooh, man. Yeah, that's crazy. That's... Inajiro Asunuma was now. a Japanese politician and leader of the Japanese Socialist Party. Asanuma was a polarizing figure in the world of Japanese politics. He'd retired from politics in 1942 after having voiced his displeasure with the direction of World War II and wouldn't return until after Japan's surrender in 1945. By that point, having become an outspoken socialist and left-wing activist, he caused massive controversy in 1959 after visiting communist China and declaring in a speech in Beijing that the United States was the shared enemy of Japan and China and even returned to Japan wearing a Mao uniform, openly expressing his support for Mao Zedong's communist regime. After this, Asanuma began leading protests against the US-Japan Security Treaty, leading marches on the Japanese diet itself. This greatly angered the far-right group, the Great Japan Patriotic Party, and its leader, Bin Akeo. Akeo believed that Asanuma was going to lead a communist revolution against the Japanese government. The Great Japan Patriotic Party was strongly pro-United States, and were in favor of Japan's alliance with them. The group would launch counter-protests during Asanuma's marches, which would often lead to many arrests on both sides. One activist, who had been arrested a total of 10 times at these events, was 17-year-old Otoya Yamaguchi. The son of a high-ranking officer in the Japan Self-Defense Force, he joined the Great Japan Patriotic Party when he was only 16 after being radicalized by his older brother. As time went on, and the protests from both sides continued, Yamaguchi eventually became disillusioned with Akeo's leadership, believing that the latter was not, quote, radical enough. On May 29, 1960, Yamaguchi left the group in order to take divisive action on his own. Oh, on October 16, 1960, Inajiro Asanuma was participating in a televised election debate at Hibiya Public Hall in central Tokyo, which also featured the leaders of other major parties, including the then Prime Minister, Hayato Ikeda. The debate took place before an audience of 2,500 people and was also broadcasted nationwide. As soon as Inajiro began his speech, he was heckled by far-right audience members and had to stop speaking while the moderator for the event asked for calm. え、Five minutes later, Asanuma began his speech again. What you're seeing here is essentially Asanuma's final moment of life. As you can see, he turned to look to his left. What he saw was Otoya Yamaguchi running towards him with a 13-inch samurai sword that he has stolen from his father. Less than a fraction of a second after this shot, Yamaguchi stabbed him right between his ribs. He then attempted to turn the blade on himself, but was wrestled to the ground by bystanders and event staff. Asan My boy ran up there with a samurai sword and killed him. He went up there, yeah, and they tried to kill himself and they stopped him. That's, that's insane. Why he didn't have a gun? Let's keep going. Numa was immediately rushed to a nearby hospital. However, the blade had cut his aorta, 
which led to him dying minutes later from internal bleeding. Following the assassination, Otoya Yamaguchi was arrested and imprisoned awaiting trial. Throughout his imprisonment, he remained calm and composed and freely gave extensive testimony to the police. Yamaguchi insisted that he had acted alone and without any direction from others. Okay, on November 2nd, he wrote on the wall of his cell using toothpaste, Long live the Emperor, and hanged himself with knotted bedsheets. This photo was taken immediately oh. after Yamaguchi stabbed Asanuma by Yasushi Nagao. It won the 1960 World Press Photo of the Year, and a year later, Nagao was awarded a Pulitzer Prize for the photo. Yamaguchi immediately became a... I mean, that photo was fire. That's a dope photo. But at the same time... So this is after he stabbed him, so I'm guessing this is when he already pulled it back out. ...was taken immediately after Yamaguchi stabbed Asanuma by yeah, Yasushi so Nagao. It won the 1960 World Press Photo of the Year, and a year later, Nagao was awarded a Pulitzer Prize for the photo. Yamaguchi immediately became a hero and martyr to the Japanese right-wing activists. On December 15th, 1960, a large number of right-wing groups gathered in the very same Hibiya public hall where the assassination took place to hold a national memorial service for Yamaguchi. Oh, 60 snap. years later, That's Yamaguchi crazy. is still revered by these groups. What? And they are still holding memorial services every year on November 2nd, My boy the became anniversary a, of his suicide. A national hero for the right-wing crazy people in Japan. I'm not too big on politics, but I can't see that happening over here in the United States. The dude that assassinated JFK, nobody celebrates him. Whoever wanted JFK to be assassinated, nobody celebrates him. I don't even know the dude's name, you know what I'm saying? That was kind of crazy though, he did that on live TV. That's how you know that. First off, he was a little bit off, clearly, because he hung himself in his jail cell talking about long live the emperor. Bro, you doing way too much. But he got balls to do that on live TV. Christine Chubbuck was an American reporter who worked at WXL-TV as an evening news reporter, later moving on to host a morning community affairs talk show titled Suncoast Digest. Chubbuck, who was known to detest what she referred to as blood and guts reporting, i.e. sensationalized violence over legitimate journalism, had volunteered to produce a feature on suicide for the station, during research for which she had asked a police officer how someone would go about taking their own life. On July 15th, 1974, Christine read an eight-minute newsreel made up of three stories. On the fourth story, which was about a shooting at a local restaurant, the reel jammed. At this point, Christine simply turned to the camera and said, in keeping with Channel 40's policy of bringing you the latest in blood and guts and in living colour, you are going to see another first, attempted suicide. Chubbuck then drew a revolver that she had hidden in her bag and turned it on herself as the technical director scrambled to fade rapidly to black. After being rushed to oh. Sarasota Memorial Hospital, it was discovered by WXL-TV news director Mike Simmons that Chubbuck had left behind both a follow-up news story describing her suicide attempt and a oh. note in which she said goodbye to her co-workers and loved ones, also expressing the chilling sentiment that she wanted everybody to see the broadcast. The footage of Christine's That's suicide was never... She did that mess on live TV broadcasting in the newsroom. He better not say the footage of her doing that never saw the light of day. If that was her dying wish, why would they not show that? Shown to the public. Wow. The two copies of the master tape that were known to exist were given to her family, who oh, destroyed okay. them. According oh, to an article no. by Vulture on June 8, 2016, the video does still exist in the hands of Molly Nelson, the widow of the former owner of WXL-TV. Her husband, for reasons he never shared, kept a copy of the tape, and when he died, it passed to her. However, when this was publicized, she started getting requests to see it, which made her uncomfortable. She says that the tape is now in the hands of a very large law firm for safekeeping, and that she has no intention to ever let anyone else see it. She also stated that it. she only held onto the tape to honor her husband. As such, it's highly unlikely this footage will ever be seen by the public. I want to see it. That's crazy. On air with the gun and said, now you're about to see a in time suicide. Bah! That's...
on April 15, 1989, Liverpool Football Club faced Nottingham Forest in an FA Cup semi-final match at Hillsborough Stadium in Sheffield. The stadium had had several incidents before involving fan crushes due to overcrowding in the standing terraces, where hundreds more fans were allowed into the areas than should have been allowed. Uh -oh. In fact, the stadium was not chosen to host it's any like FA Cup semi-finals at all between 1981 and 1987 due to safety concerns. Before the match, Liverpool FC had even made a complaint when they noticed that the pens were already overcrowded. In an attempt to keep peace between the fans of the two teams, they were kept separate on two sides of the stadium. While there were far more Liverpool fans, Nottingham's fans were sat in an area with a capacity of over 29,000 and over 60 turnstiles for people to enter through. The Liverpool fans were placed in the north end of the stadium, which had a capacity of 24,000 with only 23 turnstiles. At 2.20 p.m., 40 minutes before kickoff, 350 people arrived on several buses. Because these people arrived so close to the start of the game, this caused congestion at the turnstiles. Before the start of the game, the BBC commentator pointed out that there was already far too many people in the standing area. The police requested a 10-minute delay to the match to give them time to get the fans into the stadium in a more orderly manner. However, this request was denied. At this point, there were around 5,000 people outside the stadium waiting to get in. To reduce the number of people outside, several exits were opened to allow fans to begin flooding into the standing pens. The people at the front of the pens were suddenly this. pushed into the fence from behind as more and more people began pushing their way into the stadium. Before long, the people standing next to the fences were being squashed against them from behind, oh. to the point where some of them couldn't move at all. In an what? attempt to try and reduce the crush, some fans managed to climb over the fence and did their best to lift as many people out of the pens as they could. People from the stands above the pens were also lifting fans to safety. The police thought the people crazy? climbing over the fence were trying to invade the pitch and began stopping people from climbing over. Eventually, uh... the fence in pen 3 collapsed and the fans at the front fell as the people behind them were unable to stop themselves from tripping over them due to the sheer force of the crush pushing into the fence. With the number of fans now free, they began breaking down parts of the fence to help those trapped in the crush to escape. Uh... By this point, many fans had already died from asphyxiation or from trampling. The police were actively oh, stopping the fans from getting that? medical help for the injured, as they wouldn't allow any of the ambulances outside the stadium to enter. 96 people died in the crush, 96? and 766 were injured. Sheesh. The police and stadium officials maintained their innocence for many years after the event, saying that the crush was the result of hooligans storming into the stadium without their tickets. I am sick of seeing on television and reading in the press these instant experts, doctors and a few lawyers, who all seem to know more about our job than we do, telling us what we should have done, that if there had been police officers just inside those gates that day, Fun, uh, funneling people into the outer areas, then this wouldn't have happened. And I'm saying to you that if police officers had have been in there, when this mob surged through, the police officers would have been trampled to death underneath it. You just can't handle them. And the vast majority of that lot had been drinking, the ones that were arriving late, and they will not be told where to go. They won't do anything you try to do. And what can you do? So are you saying the fans are to blame then? The police certainly aren't to blame, because if the fans would do what the police are asking them to do, there wouldn't be any problem, because people would be orderly. And if people were orderly, they wouldn't have these problems. You, you can't crush all those people if I'll people were orderly. It's yeah. just not possible, unless you know why that I don't. All I know is that when you're trying to control that number of people, when they refuse to be controlled, refuse to be directed or guided where you're trying to get them in anything like an orderly fashion, that makes it almost impossible and almost uncontrollable. South Yorkshire's chief constable has now banned all his officers from commenting on Saturday's tragedy. All I'm concerned about is finding the cause of the tragedy and making sure that such a thing cannot happen again. I welcome the tribunal and I have never made any comment about the behaviour of fans because the behaviour of fans and the behaviour of policemen and the behaviour of many other people during that event are matters for the tribunal and not matters for public discussion. However, no, that's understandable because I think it's all of their fault. Let's keep it a stack.
the police definitely should have handled it better. But I'm sure if you've ever been to a sporting event, you know how fans act stupid. That's me, bro. I'm one of those fans. I don't care. So <laughs> I'm sure the police were to blame. Duh, the fans were to blame. Everybody was to blame. Fans pushing in. Ah! I'm sure there were people in the front being smushed. And other people were like, stop, wait, stop. But fans didn't care. The police thought they were trying to hop over. So police were stopping them. Everybody's to blame. 26, 2016, the families of the 96 people who died took the South Yorkshire Police to court where the jury concluded that the people were killed due to police negligence. Oh, Many of the deceased okay. were children and teenagers, with the youngest being only 10 years old. Unlike Dang. the Bradford City Fire, where the police did everything they could to save the fans from danger and even worked together with them to do so, the police at the Hillsborough disaster did everything they could to stop the fans from getting to safety. And because of this, oh, 96 people that. died in what is the darkest day in British football history. Dang. Well, look like I'm wrong. It's okay to be wrong. A nightclub fire? Dang. On October 30th, 2015, Romanian metalcore band Goodbye to Gravity was celebrating the release of their new album with a free concert at Club Collective in Bucharest, Romania. This being a special occasion, the band had prepared a pyrotechnic and light show to accompany them during the concert. About an hour and a half into the show, the pyrotechnics were set off. As this happened, sparks ignited one of the pillars of technical Sheesh. scaffold and caught fire. Due to the pillars supporting the roof being covered by flammable acoustic foam, the fire spread very quickly to the ceiling mm. and caused it to collapse. Upon noticing the fire, the audience, which comprised of 200 to 400 people, began trying to flee the building to get to safety. Of However, course. There was only one working exit, and oh. a stampede quickly began as concertgoers Ooh. rushed to the only half-open exit, climbing over each other to get to safety. The concertgoers reportedly had to break down the other half of the exit to escape. The emergency services arrived 11 minutes after being called, and the code red state of emergency was declared after witnessing the nightmarish sight of concertgoers with full body burns screaming in agony. Over 500 emergency workers were called in, including firefighters, police, and medical crews. 27 people were pronounced dead at the scene, including Goodbye to Gravity guitarists Vlad Tellier and Mihai Alexandru. The band's drummer, Bogdan Enak, died from his injuries on November 8th while being transported to a hospital in Switzerland. Hey. Bassist Alex Pascu died on November 11th after being transferred to a hospital in Paris, France. Hey. In total, 64 people died. So the whole band almost died. It makes sense though. There's only one working exit. The band is in the back playing. You know what I'm saying? So of course, they'll be the last ones to leave. That sucks. Died. After it was determined that the fire safety precautions had been ignored on the night of the concert, oh, I'm suing. three of the club's owners were charged with negligent yep. homicide and bodily yep. harm. Yep. Following the fire, three days of national mourning was declared. In the week after the fire, Protests erupted throughout Romania, with people calling for the resignation of Prime Minister Victor Ponta and Minister Gabriel Opria, accusing them of corruption for allowing the club to go ahead with the concert despite the owners obviously ignoring the safety regulations. Vocalist Andre Galut was the only member of Goodbye to Gravity to survive the fire, That's suffering burns crazy. to 45% of his body. This incident is very similar to the station nightclub fire which I covered in the first horrifying incidents video. Both could have been avoided if the bands of both concerts hadn't insisted on using pyrotechnics on small indoor stages. If they'd opted to perform the show without, people wouldn't have had to die so needlessly. That is true. They were just trying to put on a good show though, my G. MC. Dallas. Daniel Pellegrin, better known by his stage name, MC Deleste, was a Brazilian rapper operating out of Sao Paulo. Beginning his career in 2009, he quickly gained a substantial following, and by the time he was 20, he was reportedly earning upwards of $85,000 a month. Deleste oh, would okay. often write songs about his very difficult and tumultuous life growing up in the slums of Sao Paulo, with lyrics about poverty, crime, drugs, police brutality, and death. On July 7th, 2013, Deleste was performing a free concert in Sao Paulo for an audience of 4,000 people. During the show, he began ranting about the police, as he normally would in his songs. As he did this, however, a gunshot rang out and he fell to the floor. Deleste had oh. been shot in the abdomen. He was rushed wow, to the hospital, huh? but died later that night of his injuries. He was the seventh rapper to be gunned down since 2010, and the police investigating his murder 
believed that the culprit was most likely an ex-police officer vigilante, as the bullet recovered from Delas's body was actually the same type that the police used. They said that there was most likely an entire group of these vigilantes targeting rappers in order to silence them. One of Delas's friends has said that he believes that the police themselves may have murdered him, as he was actually accused by the police of stealing both his car and the expensive clothes he was wearing on the day of the concert. So the Brazilian police is out here murdering the rappers? However, he insisted that they were not stolen. The friend also said that the police attempted to extort money from Deleste on his way in. His friend believes that the same police officers returned during the concert to carry out the hit. In the years since the murder, no arrests have been made and the case remains unsolved. Yeah, By the way folks, the I know a lot of you wanted to see the footage of Deleste being shot but please understand that showing that footage would result in this video being age restricted. Exactly. However, if you want to see it, it's out there. Feel free to look for it yourself. Another stadium disaster. All right, let's see what happens. On May 29th, 1985, defending European Cup champions Liverpool was set to have a match with Italian team Juventus in the European Cup final. The game was to take place on neutral grounds in Belgium's national football arena, the Heisel Stadium. By 1985, Heisel Stadium had fallen into disrepair as it hadn't been properly maintained in several years, with the 55-year-old cinderblock walls literally crumbling, to the point where fans without tickets were able to kick holes in the walls to illegally enter the stadium. On, fans no. of the British football team, Arsenal, had described the stadium as a dump and the CEOs of both Liverpool and Juventus requested for the game to be moved to a different stadium. Okay, that's what I was about to say. Why are y'all playing here if the stadium is that busted? As Heisel simply right. was not in any condition to host such a major game, but UEFA refused to move the game. There were roughly 60,000 fans in attendance. Oh, On snap. each end of the stadium behind the goals, there were three standing terraces. Originally, both teams' supporters were supposed to have three terraces each. However, one of the terraces on Liverpool's side was reserved for neutral Belgian spectators. As a result, Juventus fans had more space than the Liverpool fans. However, this divide between the two sides would end up being for nothing, as it soon became apparent that Juventus fans were in the neutral zone right next to the Liverpool fans. One hour before kickoff, conflict broke out between the two sides in the Liverpool oh, and neutral terraces. The only brawl? thing separating the two sides was a weak chain link fence and eight police officers standing between the two terraces. Hooligans from both sides started to throw flares, bottles, and even pieces of the crumbling terrace beneath them. Oh, Before long, snap. groups of Liverpool hooligans broke through the barricade and overpowered the police. Oh. They then charged at the terrified Juventus fans, with many eyewitnesses saying that the hooligans were armed with deadly weapons such as knives, bats, and even some small firearms such what? as pistols. The Juventus fans ran for their lives to the perimeter wall at the end of the terrace, with some being able to climb over to safety. However, most ended up trapped in a crush between the wall and the invading Liverpool fans. Eventually, the old wall completely fell apart, which allowed more fans to escape. However, some were crushed under the stone, and many were also trampled during the rush. The Juventus fans on the other side of the stadium, angered by what was happening, began rioting. They began making their way down to the neutral terrace, but hey, soccer fans are insane! were stopped by the police. Fans fought the police they for two hours, flares with one stuff? fan reported to have fired a gun at the police. In the chaos oh, of the event, snap. 39 people had died and 600 were injured. The match still went ahead after the captains from both teams appealed for calm from the crowd and despite knowing that people had died in the lead up to the match, both teams were able to put on an impressive show, with Juventus eventually winning. Blame for the incident was directed solely at the Liverpool fans, Liverpool 26 Christ. of them being charged with manslaughter. However, investigators determined that the terrible state of the stadium was also partly to blame for what happened. All English teams were barred from competing in the UEFA League for five years as a result of the disaster. The Heisel Stadium continued to host games until 1995, when it was completely revamped and renamed the King Baudouin Stadium. Despite the new name, the shadow of the horrific events that happened in 1985 will always hang over the stadium. Bro, if I was at a bro, if I was at a sporting event and fans started to try to fight one another and kill one another, I might join in. <laughs> mm. 
The 24 Hours of Le Mans is an endurance racing event in which drivers must race for, as the name suggests, 24 hours, with the winning team being the one that covers the most distance. And this okay. event has been held since 1923. That in 1955, right. three teams competed in the race, representing three different car manufacturers, Ferrari, Mercedes and Jaguar. One of the Mercedes drivers was Pierre Levey, a French driver who had come close to winning the competition in 1953, but came up short due to malfunctions in his car and also driver fatigue as he had raced the entire 24 hours by himself without oh, switching snap. with another driver. He okay. was hoping to he rectify he this beast. loss with a win at this year's race. The Le Mans would always take place on the Circuit de la Sarthe, a track constructed for the first race back in 1923. It had remained unchanged since then, meaning it could no longer accommodate cars going at over 100 miles per hour when it was originally designed for cars going at 60 miles per hour. Few safety precautions had been put in place either, with only a small concrete wall and fencing to separate the track from spectators. Oh. As such, an accident was just waiting to happen. Yeah, it Jaguar like driver it. Mike Hawthorne, on his 35th circuit of the race, had attempted to pull over into a pit stop. Lance Macklin, who was right behind him at the time, was taken by surprise by Hawthorne suddenly braking and accidentally made a small collision with a kink in the track. As he continued to swerve in a desperate attempt to regain control of his car, he was clipped by Pierre Levey. The collision caused Levey's car to fly into the air and crash land right into the stand where spectators were watching oh. the race. Parts of the car continued rolling through the crowd for around 100 meters. Any spectators standing in the line of the car Got parts of the suffered horrific deaths. Yeah. While this was going on, the car's fuel tank had burst into flames. Oh. Because the car's body was made from magnesium, this resulted in a Class D fire, which cannot be extinguished with water. So the fire crew only made it worse by spraying it with a hose. The mm. race continued on during the chaos, with the fire raging for several hours before finally going out. 84 people had died, and 120 were injured. Pierre Levey had been flung from the car as it collided with Lance Macklin's and was killed after his skull was crushed when he hit the ground. The race's organizers, of course, faced criticism for allowing the race to continue. Their defense was that had the race been called off, the spectators in attendance would leave and jam the roads, which would have prevented emergency services from arriving to help the injured. Yeah, Some right. drivers quit the race out of respect for the dead. I will However, too. Mike Hawthorne, the driver who inadvertently caused the events that led to the disaster, not only finished the race, but he went won. on to win. Following the incident, many European countries banned motorsports until the tracks had been modified with better safety measures for the spectators. The event is considered to be the biggest disaster in motorsport history. Yeah, it is sounds... what led to all motorsport tracks having huge fences around them, as well as placing spectator stands far away from them, so that nothing of this magnitude ever happens again. Hmm. Alright bro, great video from the homie Sevox. Thank you guys so much for requesting it. Yeah, these were some horrifying live events, man. People dying, just coming there to spectate and watch some soccer or football. People dying just to go see their favorite band play. People dying just to see the cars racing and getting killed. Yo, this is... Man, what would you do in some of these situations? Let's say you were you were there watching the cars race and then the car hit the ramp and it's coming directly at you. Ah! What you gonna do? I'm ducking. I don't know, man. That's crazy. But yeah, man, great video. Shout out to the gang. See you guys tomorrow. Yeah, everybody have a great night.